Amen. Everybody loves transition, except when they have to transition. <laughs> well, we don't want to disappoint you. Come on now, Mario. We are standing on holy ground, and I that you know it, you can join in. Come on. We're standing in his presence. Come on. We are standing on holy ground. On holy ground. And there are angels all around. said that is a place of joy that is a place of security that is a place of peace that is a place where you take us father into your very presence to bless us so i pray for your blessings today i pray for the anointing in your presence today let your word touch our hearts and minds and draw us more closely to you in jesus name and all the saints together said amen Amen. God bless you. Thank you. Please be seated. Well, it's good to be here this morning, and I'm not going to say anything about football. <laughs> At all. Maybe. No, so it's good to be here today, and we, are, we love Jesus, and we love to be in his presence, and we love to know him in a very special way. And we are in a time of transition here at the Life Center as well as the body of Christ. And I know that even here at the Life Center this time, we know that come January, Apostle Don will be taking my place and will be the new apostle over the Life Center. But I want you to know Dr. Mary and I are not going away. I'm going to be his best support he's ever had. I'm going to be the wind beneath his wings, but I'm not going to interfere. Whatever he tells me to do, I'm going to be willing to do it. Amen. But we look forward to that transition, and he is, uh, will be finishing his, his education, his master's come Jan I mean December. And so he'll be here in January full time, but he'll be preaching a couple of times this coming month and coming next month. So that's transition. I mean, we've been here for 35 years. He's on 35 years. Whew. I didn't know I'd ever have any one job for 35 years. Either I'd get fired or I'd quit, one or the other. But the Lord had his way, and we've been obedient to follow his way, and we're blessed. You know, we're blessed to be here and blessed to have you in our lives and us in your life. It's a blessing, believe me. If it weren't... Uh, for the people, you know, it, 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 as we all say, and the good news is the people, the bad news, the people, you know, it's, it's both the pleasure and those propositions or those challenges that we have to face. This morning I want to begin, and I'll finish it next week, but I want to begin to talk about a transition that I want to tell you that the church is in this transition. Dr. Mary and I spent a week in Santa Rosa with Bishop Hammond and the Board of Governors and all of the people there and listen very carefully at what is taking place. 
And I'm going to be more specific about that, but I want to build a foundation to move us toward that. And I want to go back to a, and when, the, when I heard all of the transition that's taking place, I went back to the book of John, and there I began to see that there is a verse there that we want to build upon. But I want to give you some background. As you know, John was, the God, was God's favorite, according to John, and Jesus' favorite, I should say. But I think all of us feel favorite, don't we? Isn't it wonderful that we can all be Jesus' favorite? And But anyway, when it began to write up the book of John, John declared, first of all, that Jesus was eternal. In the beginning, what? Was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And everything that was made, he made it. So we know that God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit were in place before the foundation of the earth. And it was already a plan in place for Jesus so for all those many years, for however long it was, he was resonant in the heavenlies with the Father. And then we see in 1 John, not only does he declare it, but he goes on to say, and we beheld his, he beheld the flesh and, and blood among us, and it was with him the fullness of grace and glory. So John says, I not only knew about it, but I was there, and I experienced the glory that came out of it. And then we also know it's significant in that first chapter of John that he said he came into his own, and his own received him not. And that is important because you see the, the declaration or the PR person was John the Baptist. His job was to announce that this Messiah was coming. And that's why he was baptizing in the Jordan under the Jewish, under the old ritual, but saying as he, as he did that, there is one greater than I am coming, and he will take not only will he baptize you in water, but in the power and in the Holy Spirit. He was declaring as he was declaring the baptism for repentance for the Jews, but he was declaring that there was a greater baptism coming, and his job was to announce it. You remember that Jesus said all of those that are, are that in the old kingdom, as we will say, or the old dispensation, none was greater than John. He was faithful to, to fulfill, but John knew that there was coming greater, and he said, out of this, I must what? Decrease so that he can increase. And so we begin to see that at the, we are now coming from heaven to the declaration by John that this is the Messiah and declared him so. And then we see there the next step was the wedding at Cana in which Jesus went into his public ministry. By the way, before he did that, he chose some disciples. He came, the full manifestation of the fulfillment of the prophecies was that the Messiah had come. And John announced that, and Jesus began his ministry by first finding those disciples that God had already chosen. Then the disciples and, and Jesus went to the wedding at Cana, and this became the declaration of his public ministry. It began there as his mother pushed him into his ministry and says, it's your time has come. And it was that time. And then Jesus immediately went from there to the temple and there he found money changers and taking advantage of, of the Christian believers. And so he cleaned out the temple, showing that what the temple had needed to be cleansed so that the truth could come forth. He said, it's a place of prayer. And then we move a little bit further, that third chapter of John, where he meets Nicodemus, and now he tells us how you make that transition. You must be born again. You must be born not of, not of nature only or in the natural, but spiritually. You must accept the truth, and the truth will set you free, and you can be born again. And Nicodemus didn't understand it. He said, how can you do that? And he said, Nicodemus, your, your religion is holding you back. You can't accept what it is. And so we began to see now that Nicodemus was showing that there was an individual salvation. This was unknown to the Jewish people. You couldn't it just go in and accept Christ or God. You had to go in and become a Jew and let the priests and the prophets take, be responsible for your salvation and being sure that you follow the ritual. 
So we begin to see as God is in heaven has come down and he's changing the transition from religion to relationship. Now it's becoming personal. Now it is such that you and I are able to worship God directly. You and I are able to receive his truth directly. But before then, we would have had to go to the priest. And even in the early Catholic church, that same structure existed you had to go to the priest and he had to pray for you he had to forgive your sins and you had to make penance for your sins and so from that that was even an extension of the old jewish system and then we see after nicodemus jesus then took it in that third chapter what for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that what whosoever now we've extended that grace all the way from heaven through the jews from the jews now we're at a new place whosoever you mean gentiles you mean those that are not jewish or accepted what well, whosoever and now we're saying get to this john 4 which is our scripture today john 4 is the next extension of that because now there's a demonstration that we see when we come to that. And I'm just going to tell you the story of John 4 because it's 46 verses. You might get tired of listening if I read them all. <laughs> Somebody's going to try to remember to tell you the story. But you know the story. It was a time when Jesus was coming from Judea back to Galilee. That in Judea that it said that John the Baptist was losing the baptism to Jesus and his disciples. In other words, Jesus was becoming more popular, and the Pharisees didn't want that to happen, so they were bringing pressure. So Jesus was going to go back to Galilee. But to go to Galilee, most of the time, the Jewish people would go around the area because it was in those half-breeds. And you don't want to be around those half-breeds, you know. And so, but for whatever reason, it said needs be that Jesus go through Samaria. So he went through Samaria. It takes you about a day longer to go through it. But we, whether it was for to expediency, but we have to believe it was a divine appointment, don't we? When the Holy Spirit tells you to do something, usually you need to be aware that there's something about to happen. There's going to be a divine appointment. So he went through there, and, and what had happened, as we know, he was very tired and weary because they had been going a long time. And the reason, back, background-wise, was when they were sent into captivity into Babylonian, the Persians set them free, but after that, they were assigned to different nations so that they wouldn't come together. And so when they went to Samaria, they entered married with those that were part of that and they became a gentile jew they were they were divided in in who they were and so for that reason the pure jews from judah did not like them didn't associate with them they didn't think that they were worthy of who they were so this is a scene he come to the the well and he's very very tired and he sits down on the on the well and is resting and a lady at noon comes to the well to draw water. And he asked her for a drink of water. And she immediately said, how in the world could you ask me, a Samaritan, a, a, not only a Jew, but a, but a teacher of the Jews, how, how can you ask me for a drink of water? And Jesus responded by saying, well, if you knew the water I have, you would be asking me for the water because I have a water that you never get thirsty. And she said, well, wait a minute. I, this well is 105 feet deep. It's eight feet across. And you, how in the world are you going to get water? You don't even have a bucket. You don't have any way to get water. And you're talking about a living water. Something's going on here. And I know it's in the spirit, she was thinking. And so she said, well, how do you want me to do that? And he says, well, if you knew who it was that was offering this to you, you would receive it. <laughs> she said, I think you might be a prophet. <laughs> and then he told her, he said, you know, she said, well, where is your husband? She said, well, I don't have a husband. And he said, uh-huh, you've had five. And not only do you have you had five husbands, the one you're living with now is not your husband. Now, before we condemn her too quickly in her, in her moral life, you know, for, for people in that day, if, if the man didn't like you, he said, I'm going to divorce you. 
And so it only took two friends to say, I agree with him, and they were divorced. So there were a lot of divorces, you know. I mean, that was a common practice. So if I'm tired of this wife, I'd give me another one. So before we condemn her as being immoral, we don't know. But we do know one thing. She didn't fit the Jewish <laughs> profile. She would not have been accepted at all. First, because she was Samaritan. Second, because she had been married over once. And thirdly, because she was obviously had some reputation because she wouldn't have been there at noontime drawing water. That was not the right time to draw water, full noon. So she was there, and Jesus said to her, well, I am a prophet. And she says, well, then the next thing she wanted to bring up, like everybody does, where do you go to church? <laughs> where do you worship? Where's your church base? Where do you go? And she says, uh, he's, you know, he, she said, well, I, I, I worship where the people in we worship here, Samaritans. That even go, if you go back, as the son of Abraham set up a, a, a place for us to worship. And so that's where I worship. You worship in Jerusalem, in, in, Jude, in Judea and Jerusalem. We worship in a different place. And Jesus, in, as we see this thing so move so smoothly, seamlessly into the spiritual, he said, well, one day we're not going to worship any particular temple. We're going to worship in the spirit. We're going to worship where, no matter where you are or whatever you're doing, you'll be able to worship. Now you see the progression. We've come all the way from heaven through down through the Jews, down to whosoever will. And now we're here talking to a, a Gentile Samaritan woman with a reputation that nobody wanted. Except Jesus and God. Praise God. Aren't you glad that he chose you? I'm glad he chose me because I didn't qualify. I, I wouldn't have gotten through the Jewish ritual, much less the rest. And so he says, okay, this is, uh, this is, this is what's happening. So she got it. She said, he said, I, and she said, well, one day the Messiah is coming. We all know that. He said, I am the Messiah. He laid it real clear and real clean, and she got it, and she began to worship him. Now, Jesus, when he was pondering this and thinking about how the Holy Spirit had brought him there and how all this had happened, now let me tell you, church, when the Holy Spirit's moving, you need to move because when he's doing something and Jesus knew he was on assignment. You know, when we're on assignment, we get excited about it. When we're on assignment, we know that the Holy Spirit leading us. So he was on assignment and he got so excited because he realized that that's what was going on. So as the disciples came back and they said, where'd you get food to eat? You're all fired up. Your man, you're pumped. What's going on here? What is happening? He says, I have meat that you don't know of. I have meat from the Father. In other words, when you get on course... And when you know that you know you're in the middle of God's will, there's nothing that feels so good, is it? <laughs> nothing feels better than that. That feels so good when I know that I know that I know I'm doing what I'm called to do. Whew. We get excited about it because, one, we know that God has given us that opportunity. And, secondly, we know we responded to it. And then... Jesus started talking to him. Of course, these now get it. These disciples had no idea what he was talking about. They were still as steeped in Judaism as anybody could be. You're talking about unlearning something. They were in the process of unlearning, and I'm sure their head was swimming most of the time because what is he going to do next? I mean, you know, he cleaned out the temple. Nobody does that. Nobody cleans out the temple, throw the money changers desk all over the place. What in the world is going on? And then he's talking to a Samaritan woman, and they didn't say, why are you doing this? They kept their mouth shut, and they just kept, the Scripture says they spoke not. <laughs> and so they were, they were looking at all this going on and wondering what is going on. And the transition has begun. Now, this is a scripture that, and then he says something that I want to, will be circulating back on next week. He said, look, you say the fields are ready for harvest in four months. 
what I'm telling you, they're ready now. Now is the time of salvation. Now is the time for expansion. Now is the time for increase. Now is the time for dedication. Now is the time. You're on assignment, and if you want to see God do something through you, know that and be ready because you're about to be on assignment. We're, we're moving. We're moving. We're moving. We're moving. God's moving, and I want to be where he is. I want to follow the cloud right on into the promised land. I want to be ready when I don't want to go around the mountain 12 more times. Do you? I'm tired of going around that mountain. I'm ready to to get on to the promised land. I want to see the fruit. I want to see the benefit. I want to feel the presence of the Lord in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. So that's the story rather than reading it to you. I thought I'd just tell it to you this morning. Now, now what's going on here? Let's, let's just look at this. The first thing that is happening, which always has been happening, but in a new way, is that we see a church without walls. Now, we've heard church without walls all of our life, and what that has been interpreted is you go out there and win folks and bring them back to our church and be part of our ministry. What we think it means is come in and bring folks in, get them equipped, trained, prepared, so no matter where they are, they are ready to preach, teach, disciple, and heal the sick, bring deliverance, whatever it is. We put the two belts of God around them and say, this is your two, spiritual two belt, and Thank you so much. That's a powerful mic. I got it. I got it. It's all right. Thank you. But, but it's true. We've got to be prepared to hold on to the mic and go get it. Go do it. Do what God's calling you to do. It's church without walls. You have a responsibility because you see what happened was when she got saved, it was obviously this woman at the well had some sort of charisma. I mean, she went out and after and immediately said, if you, this man told me things that nobody else could have known. He prophesied to me things. Let me tell you, you got to meet this man. He is unbelievable. Isn't that what we're supposed to do? You got to meet this man. He's unbelievable. You got to know this man. He has things that he can tell you about your life. You got to know this man. And so she went out, and first thing you know, she had, she had, a, she had a choir and a congregation. <laughs> she was ready to do business. I mean, she started drawing them in, and, and then Jesus saw what was happening. So he goes over and spends three days teaching them. Whew, whew. Can you imagine? Remind me of a, one time when I was working as a consultant with a company, and there was a... They had invited me to, uh, to their Bible study on Wednesday night. Well, I was there during the week, and there was a particular church that I'd been going to on Wednesday night. So I thought that uh, I, would, yeah, I said, thank you, I, I'll, I'll be fine. So I went to the church, and I came back that night. Well, one of the people that I, in the company I was working for was a grandson of Billy Graham. So last night... I came in the next morning to do the consulting work, and they said, who, who do you think led our, our worship last night, our Bible study? I said, I have no idea. Billy Graham. There were only four of us here. <laughs> and I thought, man. <laughs> they were talking to, the, to Jesus. He was the Bible study, just like on the road to Emmaus. He was telling them everything that had taken place from all the way from the beginning to the present. And so, and so we begin to see that not only was it a church without walls, she was out there starting a church in her own community of wherever she was, whether it's in your office, in your family, in your, wherever it is, your church is, you don't have to have a building, you don't have to have a congregation, you just got to have Jesus. You got to be able to talk about him freely. And one of the things in this transition is that's coming. We've been through the squeeze long enough. How many of you say an amen to that this morning? How many of you ready to spread it out and let's tell the truth? Let's, let's proclaim the truth and set the captives free. We don't know how to handle it. We got confused. But it's coming back. Say amen. 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 
So here we are. The first thing is that it was that there was a church without walls. And John 4, in that scripture, let's re re look at John 4, 20, which is uh, the scripture. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain. And you Jews say that it is in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Jesus said, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You'll worship where you do not know. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. You, you're confused. We haven't left. But that's not where he ended. But the hour is coming. And now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking search to worship him. The hour is coming. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. God took the walls away. You don't have to come here. We, we've said it since the beginning. Come in here and learn to hear the voice of the Lord. Come in here to seek deliverance. Come in here and do the, to do the uh, miracles. But that's to come in here and practice. The game is played out there. You come here to get ready for the game. The game is where you want to be. And you want to say, aha, here's my salvation too. <laughs> Okay, but it is a war church without walls, truly. You, as I put it sometimes, people say, well, how do y'all do what you do? I said, well, if you, if you think of the old, my, old West, you put your brand on your cattle and then you turn them out into the field. <laughs> Let everybody graze on all the same pastures because we've got to get out there to graze and, and but know your brand, know your DNA, know it. You have a place to be covered. You have a place to be prayed for. You have a place to come and communicate. You have a place. But the church was designed, if you study the scripture, to teach, train, activate, and equip, and empower the saints to do the work of the ministry. We're all in this together. There's no hierarchy here. There's not one. Yes, you have leaders, but you don't have one that's more spiritual than the other. Listen, some of you are so spiritual, I can hardly get around you without passing out. Come on. <laughs> you really are. You really are something else. And I just love it when you say, can I pray for you? Can I pray for you, Apostle? Go on and put your hand on me and pray for me. Because you got it. Listen, I, I, you got it. I pray for you, but I need your prayers too. So it's church without walls. That was the first thing that the disciples could not understand how in the world could we be doing this outside of the temple everything's got to be done in the temple jesus has already cleaned up the temple now we're out here doing this in a most unexpected way new theology religion to relationship it still works that way second thing was he said we have living water he said, you've been married five times, but the one you're living with is not your husband. He, she said, but, and he says, but he was just using her as an example that the water he was offering is offered to everybody. It's the water of salvation. It's the water of redemption. It's the water of being washed with the word, having your sins washed away. Because a communion that we had today represents the blood of Jesus and the body of Christ that was sacrificed for you and for me so that we can take his water and let it flow all over this place. He came into his own, his own received him not. He came in and he was the life, but the life became the light. And those that were in darkness, it drove out the darkness. That's what we're doing. We got our fire, firefighting equipment. We're ready to go put out some fire. Draw, draw some darkness out. Draw it out. Okay, and then we, we see that was a Jesus was on assignment, as I said. And let's look at John 4, 31 to 34. And he explained it here. In the meantime, his disciples urged him, saying, Rabbi, eat you got to be hungry. He said, I have food to eat of which you do not know. 
Therefore, the disciples said one to another, Has anyone brought him anything to eat? Jesus said, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. I tell you where I did a series on legacy. My legacy is to do what it is God's called me to do. And then hear him say, good and faithful servant, well done. How many of you agree with me on that? Come on. How many of you will? Come on, praise the Lord with me. Come on, put your hands together. Let's praise the Lord. He's done it all for us. He prepared the way. He's made the way. He's made the sacrifice. He's empowered us with the spirit of living water, the Holy Spirit. And he was talking about the Holy Spirit. And he said, someday there's a living water. And he's called the Holy Spirit that will fill us all. And he will just gush out of us. Because when we're on purpose, when we know we're doing what we're called to do, we're, we're moving. How many of you have ever been somewhere and doing it like having fun or working and enjoying it and all of a sudden you forget the time? Yeah. say, my goodness, it is, I didn't want to wear all that time when I, I usually am kind of aware of it, but I don't even know where it is. Jesus didn't know what time it was. He didn't care. All he wanted was there's business at hand and it must be take, taken care of. So we begin to see that there's living water. Church without walls but not church without Christ. Church without walls, but church with the Holy Spirit. Aren't you glad today that the Holy Spirit is here? When you leave, he'll still be here and he'll be with you. And as you go get in your car, you'll still have that Holy Spirit. And if you forget, you can start speaking in tongues and you can declare it and say, and he shows right up right there again and he knows you right with him. And that's why he gives us a prayer language. When we don't know, like I say, you have to call on him. Yeah, that's the way I used to do when I, I'd get alone. I'd call OnStar and say, y'all up there? <laughs> Just want to check in. Well, the Holy Spirit's on call, ready for us. The third thing, as I said, Jesus was on assignment, and he knew that he had a call. The fourth thing he made clear is that there are no lone rangers. We all need each other. You know, God believes in teams, doesn't he? He's a team. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are a team that they need each other. They all do something differently, but they're one God, three parts. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit have different functions, but they're all one God. I know that's hard and sometimes to intellectually get it, but I know it because I've experienced it, and so have you. And so we know that when he taught them that there was working together. And he said it this way, the harvest is ready. It, it is ready to be done. It's, it's not four months, it's now. And he says, one plants, or one sows, one plants, and one harvest. Let me say something to you right now. You may be a five-star in kingdom God, but you may be called to humble and follow somebody else here because that's your problem. I know people get frustrated. I know they do. People get frustrated when they don't think I don't recognize them and raise them up. And they get frustrated when they think that they're not being given an opportunity. Tell me if you feel like God's. Don't, don't get mad at me. Tell me, okay, <laughs> if you're doing them that. But sometimes... And more times, we're to support somebody else. And when I started, I said, when Apostle Don gets here, I'm going to support him. I'm going to be the one that he can raise up his hands like his Aaron and her. I'm going, that's not going to be my job unless he fires me. And if he fires me, I'll start another church. <laughs> Dr. Mary said, no, 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 no. That is... I promise you that's the last thing. <laughs> that would take a direct call from God for sure. Okay, no, we're going to support him. And we're going to have a great church. 
He brings a great anointing. He's got a great vision. He's got our DNA. He's ready. He's ready. He can't wait to get here and get started. He is so ready. He just wishes this business would get over and he could get here and come. He's going to come with a lot of drive for the kingdom. So let's support him. Can I, can I hear an amen? Can I, can I get an amen on that? We're going to be supporting him in everything that he needs. Hallelujah. Thank you. No lone rangers. He said in verses chapter 4, 36, 37, 38. Let's look at that. And he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life that both he who sows and he who reaps may what? Rejoice together. For in this saying is true, one sows and another reaps. The reaper, the sower are the same. They rejoice together. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. The Holy Spirit had already prepared. Others have labored and you have entered into their labors. That's our, that's our mandate. To be a part. Something, I tell you what, you can imagine. I met a whole lot of Lone Rangers in my life. And most of them don't make it. Sorry to say that. That's not an accusation. That is a fact. When we started, we knew that there had to be the right people dedicated to the Lord and us for us to go forward. And thank you, Jesus, he did. And some of those are still here, like Elder Blake and, and Elder Judy. And I could go on and on. And Elder, uh, the sides were here. Although Elder Stephanie, we didn't know her at that time. Elder Phil, I used to have to fight the women off because they all wanted to, thought they were all called to be his bride. <laughs> And he was very good until he met Stephanie. <laughs> and then lightning struck. Amen. <laughs> All right. Not enough. That's enough about that. And then the, the fifth thing is we are to be reproducers of reproducers. Okay. John 4, 28, 29, and 30 is where the, girl, the lady went back. We're going to read that. Where she went back to her community. Imagine that. Having that kind of, res she had to be excited. She had to, she had to know that I got something you need to know. The woman then left her water pot. Wait a minute, left her water pot? You don't leave your water pot. That's like leaving your car and running back town. <laughs> left her water pot, went her way into the city and said to the men, Come, see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Boy, that was a good question to ask, wasn't it? Come, she said. See. And they went out of the, key of the city and came to, to him. That's what Andrew said when he was bringing them to Jesus in the very beginning. Come and see. You come and see. That's all you got to do is come and meet him. Come and know him. He's here. Christ is here. So they were, they were, again, church without walls. That was new for them. They had a whole new theology, and it was relationship, and without process, without going through the religion, without going becoming a Jew first and then, a, then getting saved out of that. That they had the introduction of the Holy Spirit, that all could have the Holy Spirit. What revelation was that? They couldn't believe it, that... This, this man, Jesus, was extending their minds, as we would say today, blowing their minds with all of this stuff. They thought when they hooked up with him, he was going to be famous, and they were going to be famous. And they were going to have a lot of money because he was going to make a lot of money. What a, what a shock. <laughs> he had living water introducing the Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come and visit. And then would leave when whatever it was that they were trying to accomplish. And then he said, not only that, they're not, you're not long rangers. You're going to need each other. And some of you are going to sow and some of you are going to reap. And some of you are going to plant. Some of you are going to harvest. But we rejoice together. 
And then you're to be a reproducer of reproducers, which you're to go and tell the story so that when you leave, you leave a legacy of those that you've led. So I want to bring this together, as I said, in next week a little bit deeper into the prophetic. But remember, in verse 435, where that verse there said, let me find it. Do not say, there are still four months till comes the harvest. Behold, I say, you lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. That's a declaration to you today. That's a declar prophetic declaration that God is saying through all of these what we call major prophets. He is saying that now, the word of the Lord is now. You know, most prophecy is about things to come, and that's, and that's appropriate. But the prophetic word is now. And I am so excited about now. I've been waiting a long time for now. And we're going to enjoy now. Say amen and amen and amen. Say now. So what was it he was trying to build? A common vision among all of them. As is John 17, Jesus said that they may be one as you and I are one so that they may be one. And in John 17, 11, we're one. We've got to be one. They all had godly compassion or they couldn't have changed their minds. They had to look beyond their prejudice. Their prejudice would have not allowed them to go into the places they were going to this Samaritan woman, but they had to have compassion for her, true compassion, the love and the compassion that they needed. And the third thing that Jesus was telling them, you got to have a divine sense of urgency because now is the time. Can I get an amen this morning? Well, stand to your feet this morning. This is a message of not ministry as we usually do, laying on hands, although I'm going to lay my hands on your ear and say, Father, in the name of Jesus, let the revelation of what is taking place in your church today, let that revelation fill our spirit, man. Let that revelation charge us to be a part of what you're doing now. Let your fullness come into us through the power of the Holy Spirit that would lead us into the places you've called us, Lord. And that we're equipped and ready to go and eager to be there. And Lord, when we seek you first and your righteousness and the kingdom of God, all of this other will fall into place. And Jesus said, I've come that my kingdom on earth shall be like it is in heaven. I pray a blessing over everyone that's here today. And I thank you, Lord, that we're here because we want to be a part of your kingdom expansion. Bless each one that's here today. Let them understand how really, really key they are to your kingdom. So I give you praise and honor and glory. In the name of Jesus. And all said amen. Well, why don't you give Jesus some praise if you believe that? Amen.